Hello and welcome to Live at Epifan. It is Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time and so glad you're all here to join us today. Uh, we have an incredible guest panel today with some, uh, some of the top experts in audio, all things audiovisual, live streaming, cameras and audio. Um, and uh, why don't we just get right to it and introduce them. Uh, so starting first off, we have a great friend of Epifan here today, uh, Photo Joseph. Photo Joseph, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? for bringing me onto the show. So I'm Photo Joseph. I'm a uh, content creator, photographer, filmmaker, live streamer, all those good things. And you can find me everywhere on the YouTubes and on the socials at Photo Joseph. Awesome. And we also have joining us today, Aaron Parecki. Aaron, uh, hey. uh, welcome. And I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so happy to be here uh, with you all today. I'm Aaron Parecki. I'm also, I guess, a YouTuber content content creator. Um, I focus on live streaming and live uh, video technology stuff. Do a lot of stuff here on YouTube around uh, the uh, ATEM Mini or other tools for live streaming. So yeah, very nice to be here. And of course, another friend of the channel, Curtis Judd joining us again. Curtis, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Thanks, Dan. Yeah, it's good to be here. I'm Curtis Judd. I have a YouTube channel where we talk about mostly uh, how to improve your lighting and sound for video. So really delighted to be here as well. So we've got all of our bases covered. We have live streaming, cameras, audio, um, a bunch of expertise. But I wanted to um, sort of start by prefacing this. Um, uh, Joseph, Aaron, Judd, you guys have done some pretty cool collaborations recently. I know you've been doing um, some uh, SRT streaming and aggregating some streams and creating some collaborative content. Uh, and one of the, th the sort of recurring uh, content formats that you have is the four friends stream. And we don't have John with us today, but um, I thought that's been pretty cool of how you've been able to merge your channels and your audience and create some, some, some really cool, you know, cross content with one another's channel. Joseph, why don't you tell me a little bit about how that came about and, and, and how you've been making that happen? Yeah, sure. So the whole idea was that, you know, all of us, all the channels you mentioned, we all are constantly experimenting with new streaming tech, switching tech, cameras, obviously, mic sound lighting, everything else. And, and it's just, it became a way to come together and try things out in a kind of, let's call it a safe space, but it's still a public show where we're all on together trying out some new thing. And we've only done a couple shows so far, but we're playing with, of course, some of your hardware, we're playing with some Blackmagic hardware and just trying out different things and seeing how it works on a collaborative sense. Because that's a that's one of the bigger challenges, of course, in doing live streaming. It's easy enough to do it just from you. But as soon as you want to get other people involved, it's a whole other level of, of complexity. And so this gives us a chance to all try what we're actually talking about in a real world, real life situation. And it's been a blast to do. And Aaron, I know you're always um, advising on some pretty unique workflows and solutions when it comes to creating sort of aggregated guest contribution content you know what what is your take on the four friends stream and you know how have you been able to sort of work the magic to to bring that together yeah i think joseph said it really well it's a good chance to be able to try out these new things and try out some of the new hardware and it's, yeah, a production environment, but it's also like, okay, if I make a mistake because we learn together and I've definitely made mistakes on my channel live. And then the, the question is, how do you recover from it? You know, and then I can talk about that. And it's a lot of fun to be able to do that. You know, we, uh, so just to sort of, uh, I think I actually forgot to introduce also, we do have another guest on the show who many of you are already familiar with. So why don't we introduce him now? We've got George Herbert here. Uh, oh, thanks, George, Dan. <laughs> welcome to your own show. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sort of playing host today, but you're the regular here. So, um, yeah, tell us about what's happening with you. What's going on? Yeah, well, I mean, it's another Thursday. It's another live show, which is great. But I'm actually just really excited to actually kind of be here in more of a guest panelist role today uh, with these other guys who have extensive knowledge uh, in all of these different things, as you've been hearing about, you know. I love technology, I love streaming stuff, but also in the context of what I do day to day with Epifan, my scope is a little more narrow sometimes. So I love watching the content that all of these guys put out because I get to learn something from them. Um, and, and that's always a fantastic piece. So I'm just kind of here to 
fill in the gaps a little bit today, which is kind of nice. <laughs> So uh, speaking of, you know, bringing together, you know, uh, a bunch of channels, uh, you know, the, the application of, you know, guest contribution, it's something we're seeing obviously a lot more of, um, but it's going to continue to be, um, we're expecting a, a trend that will continue. So I'm curious, you know, what kind of methods have you all tried? to merge guests and I don't know maybe we start with uh, maybe we start with Joseph because I know Joseph you've played around with things like black magic bridge and vmix call and a lot of different solutions to sort of bring in together uh, a, a bunch of different sources from different regions so um, what's you know what has been your experience in this over the last year or so sure so well I mean it goes back more than a year for sure of trying to bring people in um, it, I mean, gosh, probably five, six years ago or so, I started a, it wasn't a live podcast. We weren't doing it live, but it was a, a no, actually, no, I take that back. We were doing it live. It was kind of a video podcast format where I'd bring in a guest from some software company and interview them and talk to them about their product. And it's funny because I remember going back to setting that up. I really wanted to do a picture in picture type of thing or a split screen rather side by side type of thing and not just a picture in picture. And I couldn't do that with any basic level Blackmagic ATEM hardware. And I remember I bought the Blackmagic Television Studio, I think was the first one. It's like a thousand dollar product. And that was, you know, forget about it, didn't do anything. Traded that in for the next level up, a two thousand dollar product, and that gave me picture in picture but no split screen. And I finally had to go to the big ATEM two ME, which I'm still using today for most of my uh, my switching, to get something called Super Source. And this was also that I could bring in another guest. And at the time I was simply doing it by screen scraping a Skype call. So bringing in a Skype caller to another computer that was piping in and then that gave me the ability to do a side-by-side -side layout. So it was a massive amount of money for this ridiculously, what should have been a simple setup um, and today is you know, done much more easily. But, uh, but that's how I started doing other college, bringing them in by screen scraping a Skype call because that gave us the best quality at the time and doing a picture-in-picture -picture layout or a side-by-side -side layout using the ATEM hardware. That's where it kind of started for me. Screen scraping. So, you know, that is maybe a little less common now, but uh, still I see, I've seen a lot of setups recently with like 12 laptops and each one has a pinned Zoom caller. Um, how practical is that? I don't know. Curtis, you've been joining a lot of streams lately, um, maybe not hosting as many yourself, but when people ask you to join their productions. What, what are some of the common asks from the guest standpoint, and what is that experience like as a guest joining streams? Yeah, it well, it depends. I mean, you know, there are software encoders that attempt to do this. There are cloud-based services as well. So, you know, things like Streamyard, uh, Restream.io has a similar type thing. Um, there are apps like Ecam Live, which allow you to bring remote guests in, and I think they each have their own kind of costs and benefits. Um, but the thing, the thing that I found kind of the most interesting is that what I've done mostly with you guys and, and what we did on the, the four friends in a pearl um, a couple of weeks ago was using SRT because it's, a, it's, a, it's an open source uh, protocol that allows you to send a stream and it's very high quality, low latency, um, and it solves a lot of problems that I experienced with some of the others as well. Now, it's not to say that there isn't a place for some of these others, like StreamYard is very simple. Um, it quality wise is, is okay, you know. There's a there's a price to entry if you want to go up to a higher resolution than 720p. I think it is. Um, so there, you know, some costs and benefits there. But but the SRT stream, what we've seen so far, certainly what I've seen and, and what I've experienced with Joseph and Aaron as well, and with George on the 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 piece that we did, um, really solid, really really impressive what you can accomplish with an SRT stream. Yeah, it's kind of funny you mentioned that, Curtis, because obviously, you know, here at Epifan, you know, we have a slightly biased opinion being a hardware manufacturer, you know, that that SRT streaming being part of our hardware is of a particular interest <laughs> to us. So we kind of we kind of talk about it a lot. But, you know, we're also we're also users of it, right? Like we're, we're producing this show right now that way. And, you know, you guys have hardware to do that. But we've had a lot of our guests join us using software solutions but still using srt and it, it can make a big difference um but to kind of follow up on dan's question i'm kind of curious because i i read a lot of things on you know video engineering subreddits and stuff like that where people have said that 
solutions like vmix call either are, are have bad latency which is kind of hard to believe i would think it should be no different than video conferencing um or bad quality in some cases i think everyone's pretty aware of you know video conferencing sometimes over compresses or scales too much or whatever it is uh for myself as a guest, I'm usually asked to join other people's webinars and content like that through Zoom or Teams or something like that. And it's not my f favorite, but I, yeah, it's kind of an interesting interesting part to try and overcome. And I, I think that's what I found interesting about what, what you guys did with kind of the Four Pearl setup. We do have some questions coming in regarding SRT. I see that um, Bernard is asking about using SRT to a CDN, which, um, is that possible? I mean, yes. we're using SRT <laughs> to sort of aggregate our guest sources right now and then do some producing and mixing. And then we're sending this to, to YouTube via RTMP. But, um, uh, is anyone familiar with CDNs starting to adopt SRD as a technology? Still very limited list of companies that are doing that. Um, Really one of the few that is doing it and doing it well and really talks about it is one of the founders of the SRT Alliance, and that's Wowza. Um, not too many other CDNs are doing it. Um, I, I, you'll have to forgive me. I've, I don't even know what day it is half the time anymore, but <laughs> quite a while back, uh, we had Tim from Wowza join us for a webinar and on our live show, and he talked a fair bit about that. Um, and again, we were using an SRT-based connection and aggregating those things together, but in that instance... He was actually using um, the Wowza Clearcaster encoding hardware um, to send it to our Pearl, where we were aggregating it and sending it back out. And so, yeah, they, they exist. And um, but I think it's picking up steam. I think we'll start seeing it more and more. Um, you know, YouTube recently added HLS to their options of ingestion, and I think we'll start to see more CDNs add more pieces like that. Why don't we talk about the way that this show is being run? Because this has a, a somewhat unique setup and how this is actually happening. Yeah. Uh, George, you're probably best to describe that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, to be honest, we're, we're doing basically the same thing that you guys did for your four friends in a Pearl stream, um, which is, you know, we have kind of, in this case, we're doing five, um, but we have, you know, sort of five contributors and feeding those all into a pearl and Cameron hiding in the background is kind of mixing and switching all of us together from these various SRT inputs and then sending it back out to RTMP. We also are sending it back out to RTMP, not only to the Epifan channel, but to all of your channels as well. Um, so we're, we're multi-streaming back out as well as bringing in five different SRT streams. But SRT, as great as it is, always still does have a little bit of latency, and we've adjusted this uh, for, for the five of us to be in line with each other. It's about 200 milliseconds. Is Cameron showing the setup here behind the yeah, scenes? Yeah, Cameron's showing the behind-the-scenes stuff. <laughs> um, but 200 milliseconds is enough to really kind of ruin a real-time conversation. And look, it doesn't sound like a lot, but in terms of people having a conversation, it's too much. So we have a back channel and, and you guys did the same thing, I think, on yours, where you just you run a, a back channel of maybe even just audio in some other system. Right. It could be a phone call, could in our mm -hmm. case, we're using a Zoom call, but it really could be almost anything um, that, that just makes sure that as we're talking, it's in real time of what we hear in our monitors. Um, but then what goes out to the production feed is is all over SRT. It's a question I've got someone in my chat watching saying this is one of the clearest, sharpest streams that they've seen. So what what is the delivery method that you're doing to send to our channels right now? Yeah, and I mean, honestly, it starts from the beginning, right? Where you guys are all contributing through SRT streams. The three of you guys are professionals in this space. So you have great audio setups, you have great camera setups, and you have good gear, right? So. Um, getting SRT, and I think all of three of you are using the Pearl Nanos you used before today. So that's really the magic. We're starting from a ground level of using obviously high quality cameras and high quality audio, putting that into a hardware encoder that's sending SRT into our production workflow. But that means that we're, we have direct control over the high quality nature of that video and audio, right? We can set the bit rates we want. And, and some of us, like Aaron, has huge amounts of bandwidth to just you know, he could probably send, you know, 4K at super high bit rate if he wanted to over his connection. 
that's an advantage of using even not necessarily a hardware encoder, but even a software encoder where you have manual control, which is something that a lot of the video conferencing solutions can never give you, means that you're starting at a very high level of quality and just kind of carrying that forward. I do see a few questions coming in on chat of people asking if we have a diagram. And actually, I do have a bit of a diagram that demonstrates what we're doing here. So Cameron, if you just switch to my single, I'll switch my layout over to this uh, to this diagram, if you will. We didn't we didn't practice this. Let's do it on no, the fly, guys. No, but uh, <laughs> it's a lot easier when people see it, kind of the topology of it. So I'll just I'll switch here and you can get a sense. So we've got, um, let me see here. Uh, just bear with there we go uh, there we go um, yeah so this is basically what we're doing and I can try to zoom this a little bit and make it easier to see so Pearl 2 being the base station that sort of aggregates the streams and that's where Cameron's mixing and swap switching layouts and then you know each guest has a Pearl Nano uh, in my case I have a Pearl Mini actually so do I, but same same difference. <laughs> um, SRT into Pearl 2, and then you'll see the VC is our back channel with Zoom. Uh, that's how we're communicating with one another in real time. And then, you know, however many streams we want to push out to, in this case, we're, we're, we're streaming to YouTube over our TMP, but it could be any number. Um, the other advantage here is that you do have the capability to record ISOs of each guest on your, on your, on your Pearl 2 or on your your central mixing production box. So um, if you wanted to do some post-production or, you know, create some editing, uh, rec some recordings, um, possible to do that as well. Reflected in that diagram, which I think someone was asking about in my chat is the uh, how, what's behind our Pearl Nanos mm. in our studios. Mm. And I think it's, it's uh, one of the nice things about this workflow is that it doesn't really matter. So. <laughs> Like we just bring anything into the Pearl Nano over HDMI or SDI. And then from there, that's doing all the encoding and pushing via SRT to the main thing doing the aggregation. So in that's our cases, a point. Yeah. yeah. So you could put a DSLR camera directly into the Nano or in, in I think all of our cases, we're all using ATEM hardware sort of behind that layer of, you know, running our cameras in our normal studio environments with switchers or whatever it is, however complicated it is. We just need to produce some video feed that gets into that device over HDMI or SDI for it to get pulled into the mix. Well, to not go too far into the weeds, because I know this comes up in, in our videos all the time, um, because, you know, Joseph, your, the question was, you know, this is super clear. Whenever we do webinars, I get that question every single webinar I do. People go, this is incredible. I can't believe the quality of the visuals in this webinar. How are you doing it? Um, so maybe let's just go around and, and I'll start, but let's just go around and give like a super high level overview of what you're using. So for me, I might actually have the most basic setup of everyone here to some degree. I use a Sony A5100, very inexpensive, low level, but also you can get a lot out of it. If you want to mirrorless camera, um, Canon M200 be a great equivalent, um, that I just have HDMI into my Pearl. And then I use a, a Blue Yeti Nano over USB into my Pearl. And that's that's it. That That's all I'm doing, really. Um, that's all I need to do. And it means that I can just send that SRT stream out at, at a super high quality. So I don't know who wants to go next to give kind of high level. Probably Aaron. Aaron set up. Aaron, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure, why don't we go the other end of the spectrum? <laughs> yeah, this is, I mean, I'm using my normal, my normal streaming setup here. Uh, the, the camera is a Lumix G7. I'm a big fan of it because it's very, relatively inexpensive. Um, and then, you know, I've got my normal, my normal studio lighting. It's mainly one panel up, up there. My audio is the little, uh, Movo microphone. It's right up here off out of frame running into the camera. And then I could have plugged that into the nano, but no, I always make things complicated. So I'm actually sitting in front of my desk here where <laughs> this is running and my camera's running into my little matrix and I can send that video back out to the ATEM, a different ATEM, a monitor, whatever I want. You know, it's all routable through this, this uh, SDI matrix. And then I'm actually feeding the, the nano on the other desk via SDI because that's the easiest way for me to get a signal out there. Um, so yeah, it doesn't really matter, you know, what I've got going on here as long as I'm 
producing a, a clean, good, clean video signal and eventually getting something to the Perl, it works. Can I just point out also that kind of the cool thing here is like we're doing some, you just demonstrated it really, Aaron, is like some upstream switching. So, you know, right. you have the ability to, you know, switch your angles. That kind of alleviates our producer, Cameron. You know, he's wearing a lot of different hats today just switching this show, but with some upstream capabilities. And I think, uh, Photo Joseph, you were demonstrating some of your graphics that you can run. Cameron, why don't we switch to his ISO and, you know, we can maybe demonstrate that a little bit. But um, yeah. Yeah, sure. So yeah. like I have I don't have a whole lot set up right now, but, you know, I can bring up a, like a lower third on my graphic. Um, I have a chat integration, which is actually Aaron's chat integration that I'm, I'm using. <laughs> um, but this is all coming through a software service called Mimo Live that that's running on one of my systems with then going out as a video plus alpha over dual SDI over a Blackmagic uh, output box that then gets fed into the big ATEM where it all comes together. And I don't even have the other cameras turned on right now, so I can't switch away from this camera angle. But normally there could be up to, I don't know, seven or eight different cameras uh, activated at any one time that I can switch through. So in a way, it's like, although we're all guests, we're also kind of producers as well, right? Because right. We, we we're able to, you know, cue and key and, and, and all those things. Um, Curtis, I'm curious, you know, you do a lot of um, online education, a lot of training. Um, you know, in, 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 in previous times, a lot of that might have been delivered, obviously, in person or over video conferencing. I'm wondering, you know, in your world, where is the threshold between, you know, choosing a video video conferencing solution versus something like this where you know we're actually a little more produced and we're using some some higher end gear and streaming protocols and so forth well i mean there there are a couple things uh considerations i think number one i think partly is reach um you know if you're going to do if you're going to use something like zoom or teams or something like that you know, obviously you're, you're kind of making that a closed experience and that, that can be, you know, sometimes that's what you want exactly, but other times you want to reach a much larger audience and that's where, you know, going to other platforms, like in this case, we're going to YouTube and Facebook and actually we're going, to, I don't even know how many YouTube channels we're going to today. I know we're going to mine, <laughs> Joseph's, Aaron's, who knows, we're probably going to George and, and every, you know, who everyone <laughs> else is too, but um, of course the Epifan channel, but that's one consideration. But another one is, um, I th what, what we've seen with the pandemic when a lot of this education type material um, had to move online, some of it was already online, but some, some of it had to move online, is that we also saw um, some products become available that, that kind of make that a little easier. The Pearl Nano, I think, is one example of that. Blackmagic's ATEM, you know, the mini line is another example of that. But I think that there are a lot, there's so many more options and just a basic capture card can do a lot of that too if you choose to use a software encoder. So if you're going to use OBS or, you know, any of the others that are available out there, which is there's a whole slew of them. So you have so many different options now. It's it's just amazing. I think for education, one of the things I find most helpful is having multiple inputs. And that's where, you know, just having a single capture card isn't necessarily the best solution for that. Um, that's where having a, maybe a mini switcher is a little bit more useful. Where, so I can, for example, I can go to an overhead camera and demonstrate the use of a product. I can come back to a main camera. I can go over to a, you know, I've got an iPad that has an agenda or, you know, pre-submitted questions for my live stream. So it just gives me a lot of flexibility that is really, really nice. And so, you know, it's, it's opened up a, a kind of a big world. Uh, as far as my audience is concerned, we can do a lot of things today that we weren't doing before. Before, when I <laughs> when I first started streaming in 2015, um, it, there, the, in terms of the platforms that were available, there weren't a ton of options unless you got into the you know much more expensive productions. Um, but for you know, kind of a small time educator like myself, there just weren't a lot of options at that point. It was like Google Hangouts, which streamed to YouTube and. Um, those were some pretty, I, I actually, I, I think I've hidden most of them now. So hopefully they're not available publicly because they're pretty embarrassing, <laughs> but <laughs> um, there are just so many more options available today. It's really a great, great time to be doing this. It's kind of funny that that's a, that's a great example of how far we've come, right? Mm. It's like, oh, you wanted to be live on YouTube. You had to use Hangouts and do Hangouts Live and do all these other things. And it was just, yeah, <laughs> yeah. not exactly the, the highest of quality. Um, 
Yeah, it's pretty but amazing. it was easy. It was that's, easy. That's yeah. one of the benefits, and I think that's still a huge benefit for a lot of the systems that are out there, the, the web-based platforms. It's easy. And I see this all the time with my clients who are trying to increase the quality of their live shows. Maybe they're doing interviews or whatever it is. They have callers coming in. And all the easy solutions, I don't want to say that the easy solutions aren't good quality. They could be good quality. It's just that the people on the other end of them aren't doing what we're doing here. They aren't setting up right. the good camera and the good microphone and the good lighting. And I get this all the time, kind of, well, what platform can I use to make this look better? It's like, well, you got to get them a good mic and a good camera and a good... <laughs> They're like, yeah, no, I, they're not technical. They can't set it up, but I still need it to be better. It's like, I, I, I can't help you with that. Um, so those older solutions that are still running in their own different formats are awesome. But if you don't put the quality on the other end, then it's never going to get any better coming through. Well, I recommend StreamYard all the time to people because of how easy it is. Because like, it yeah. is easy enough that you can give it to somebody who is not familiar with the broadcast world or live switching at all, and they will be able to spin up and run a show themselves and even participate in the show and have guests who also have no experience with this. It is just, it's so easy. But yeah, if you want, if you want good picture quality and audio quality, you can't fix that after the image has been created. You have to fix it before the image has been created. And that's a good camera, good lighting, good microphone, all those things. You know, you have to send a good signal into something before you can, before you can expect to have a good picture on the other end. Yeah, and it's you know I think that's one of the things that the three of you guys do so well is is educating people on all those different pieces, whether it's the camera, the audio, the lighting, all those things. And and I think it does help people once once they've discovered your channels. You know, two weeks ago I guess our guest was a was a friend of mine, uh, John Hastings, who's a stand up comedian, and he had to pivot to online, and he. He's a perfect example of all the things we just talked about. He he doesn't have the technical know-how to suddenly <laughs> pivot to this online workflow of what capture cards are and what a decent camera is or even a decent computer um, to do it software-wise. Um, and he's, you know, and he currently streams every day on Twitch and he uses StreamYard to do it because it was easy for him to run with guests and other, other content. So um, it's... Uh, it's interesting. It's interesting to see how people have tried to overcome some of these barriers. Um, but again, yeah, like I, Aaron, you're absolutely right. It's what I rant about all the time. I think people, our, our audience will be used to me ranting about how, you know, to Joseph's point, you, <laughs> some of the stuff you see out there, even just interviews on mainstream media, like the visual and audio quality is so bad sometimes. And it's it's not hard to fix. It's just someone has to take the initiative to fix it. I feel like people are almost using it as an excuse, the pandemic as an excuse to have bad audio and video. <laughs> because prior to this, you would very rarely see on any kind of mainstream media a low quality Skype or Zoom call being broadcast. They would have sent out a crew, they would have done something to make it look good. But then when that capability went away and everybody's just required to do it on their own, suddenly it became okay for the quality to be bad. Because, I mean, look at some of the nightly talk shows that started off as a really bad, basically Zoom call being broadcast live. And you're like, are you kidding me? You guys got millions of dollars. This is the best you can do. And I feel like it's just become almost an excuse now. People go, well, hey, it's the pandemic. We have to, the best we can do is a Zoom call. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's not the case. No. <laughs> they could have just hired uh, Joseph and Aaron. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not that complicated. <laughs> Still would have cost less than a satellite truck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Actually, Aaron, it's it's interesting you mentioned that because I was checking out one of your videos recently and you were helping a friend to set up a, a charity poker stream, which introduced all mm -hmm. kinds of interesting considerations about like stream delay and the show cards. And I think you had it set up where you could see the cards of each player. Maybe you could tell us a bit about how you consulted someone in this case to, to to create that kind of a setup yeah that was a that was a blast so that one was actually a uh i was doing the behind the scenes tech for it but i was not on the stream at all and i wasn't the host of the event uh and that was um i think that was actually just last week i did i did a live stream about like the super in-depth so definitely take a look at that video if you want like the step-by-step -step of the entire workflow but it was uh we used Streamyard for for the hosts because they were able to then just talk to each other, join from a browser, super easy, and then screen shared the gameplay into it, basically. Although that's sort of where things got really complicated because 
if you're imagining you're playing a live poker game and the audience can see everybody's cards, you don't want a player to be able to pull up the live stream to see what other players have. So we had to delay the entire stream that's showing the poker or the hands by 15 minutes to avoid the problem of players need, being able to cheat. That's so a huge delay. <laughs> it's a huge delay. And the, the real challenge was that it was, it's too long to just use like the sort of natural delay that occurs in these kinds of systems. Like, you know, we can tweak the delay of this. I don't know how high, but we're at 250 milliseconds right now. We could probably go a second or two, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. But beyond that, it's like, you can't really do that in just these built-in tools. And at the same time, the other way that you can typically delay stuff is full on start and stop recording and then play back, play back the recording. And I've done that too, where it's like, we want to delay a broadcast by five hours. And that's very easy because you can put a recording on an SD card, pop it in a player and, and roll it later. But this was a three hour event that had to be delayed 15 minutes. So you needed to be just slightly shifted back continuously. And that's where the, the real challenge sort of uh, came up, which was, yeah, it was fun. It was fun to be able to do all that in a relatively short amount of time. And also we had to change up some of our workflow at the last second. so. Yeah, if you want the details on that, go check out my my live stream where I, I really dove into the technical bits. And you were still able to make use of StreamYard, which is kind of interesting because you're you're using yeah. cloud production together with I'm assuming some hardware production solution there, which is very interesting. But it brings up yeah. a question that maybe I'll just throw this out to the group: is you know we're seeing a lot more cloud production solutions, whether it's StreamYard or Lightstream even, I think was just acquired by Vitek. Um, Showflow is another one that has sort of made its way onto the radar recently. So I'm just curious, like, what are your opinions about cloud production and where it can take us, but like what its limitations might be? And I'll just open that up to whoever <laughs> has an opinion there. Um, I, I have some thoughts. Uh, <laughs> So if you've been following my channel for a while, you know I'm a big fan of hardware and doing stuff in hardware and off of computers, not on computers. I don't trust computers enough to run to, to use them for doing the heavy lifting of shows. So that's why I stay away from things like OBS, even though it is very powerful and you can do a lot more stuff in it. And that's why I've got all this gear on my desk. That's why I've got uh, you know hardware switchers, hardware encoders, and things like that. Um, but I have also then been finding a lot of uses for some software-based things as well. Although I prefer that software to be then also not on my own computers. Because again, the more stuff I'm running on my own computers, the more it's just, it's just very fragile. So I've been really in interested in a lot of this cloud production stuff where I don't necessarily want an entirely cloud, cloud-based switcher like StreamYard because of the limits uh, of, of that platform, even though, again, it has a lot of benefits. But I like this sort of hybrid approach of I, I can run all my cameras locally here so I can do ridiculous stuff with all these different camera angles and whatever. But then maybe some of the things that I'm already adding in software myself, for example, my chat overlay is a web browser source. My, uh, the confetti that, that pops up in a super chat, that's actually a web page also. And uh, things that aren't necessarily like really hardware driven in the first place. That stuff I don't mind being up in the cloud because that is that is a good place for it. It's it is already software driven, and there's a lot of advantages um, to moving that stuff out in the cloud as well. And you can get more redundancy built in that way too. So I'm I'm starting to to I'm enjoying exploring that kind of hybrid of still hardware video feeds, but software for the stuff the software is better at of of doing that kind of those kinds of overlays and graphics generation. Mm -hmm. I think you'll find that's a bias that the three of us have, uh, Aaron and Joseph <laughs> and I. We we all kind of approach it that way. So, I, you know, typically I'm using a, a, a hardware switcher of some sort and then uh, a hardware encoder to send that off to, you know, to the, to the platforms where I'm sending it. And then just like with Aaron, uh, same thing. I, if I'm going to do some sort of like a chat overlay, I use Aaron's chat overlay as well that's running on a separate computer. So if that goes down and that's the, that's the delicate part, that's the part that's oh, hey. really fragile. Potentially for me not, real quick, not your software. Oh, sorry. So, so oh, there. There. got a super chat. Thanks Petra. Really There's cool. the confetti. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's a perfect <laughs> example of, you know, so if something like that went down, Aaron's whole stream is not messed up. He can still move forward 
you know, missing a few features and that's no big deal. But when you start, especially like for if you're doing some educational stuff and you have to share an app on your screen, um, you know, that gets really complicated if you're running a software encoder there, plus you're running, you've got the, you know, you've got Chrome open with the YouTube stream page. You've got your app, you know, various apps running. It's just a lot. Um, there's just a lot of potential failure points there and, and being and able the to Windows move. update comes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, so being able to move a lot of that to hardware is is all. It, it I think it results in at least in my experience, it results in fewer mistakes on the live streams. And we were talking about this before. There are a million potential failure points when you're doing live, and uh, the the more of those you can kind of put into a lower risk category, i.e., hardware, the better. Photo Joseph, what's your opinion on? what's coming i mean what's the outlook for 2021 and beyond you know we're kind of witnessing in real time this shift from you know maybe more on premise to virtual to hybrids of some sort where did, where are these trends taking us well okay so a couple of different questions so we, t we want to talk about events or the tech behind the events where, where yeah i mean it could be the tech question. behind the events but also you know how do we support events that maybe are, you know, requiring an on-premise component together with remote guests, uh, you know, how will we, how will the hardware support the content yeah. in the coming year? Well, I think because the hardware is getting cheaper and cheaper, and we can very much thank Blackmagic for doing this with the ATEM lineup and starting launching mm -hmm. the ATEM Mini, which was, I mean, their timing of that could not have been better, right? It was late 2019. Um, yeah, late 2019, just before the pandemic hit, that their cheap lineup of switchers was launched. And then they just kept introducing new, bigger and better ones that are incredibly affordable and which do allow anybody who's got even just a little bit of a budget and a, a DSLR, DSLM camera laying around to be able to have that really high quality contribution capability. So I think part of it is the demand of people to say, no, no, no just a, a webcam is not good enough. Um, spend a little bit of money, and it's not a lot, spend a little bit of money, and if you want to be a part of this event that's a hybrid event, like you're saying, something where people are calling in, you've got to look good. It has to look good and sound good, so here's the, the barrier for entry, and it's pretty low bar, so just get it up, get it done. And because this is now so affordable, it really does make it easy for people to do, and it doesn't take that much technical knowledge to set it up and you know watch a couple of YouTube videos. I'm sure there's one or two out there, and you can <laughs> figure that out and, and get up and running. So it does open up the option, I think, for the future events to have more people calling in and being remote, which, you know, pre-pandemic, if you wanted to speak on an NAB panel, the only way was for you to go to NAB, go to Las Vegas and do it. I don't know that there was any panel where they brought somebody in virtually unless there was some super famous uh, individual director or producer or whatever that they could only get in that way because of their time. And so that's all right, we'll make an exception. But you know, normal people like us, there's no way we'd be able to no. speak that way. We have to be there. But I think even now then, it's it like, was well, usually the, the Skype call with the webcam up the nose. Right, exactly. Even then it was exactly that's what it was. But I think now the I can imagine the next NAB that is in person that they'll be opening up to say, look, if you want to attend virtually as a speaker, but you're going to be on a projector to a room full of people who do want to attend in person, that that'll be an option as well. And, and it should be an option. Let's let's make this as hybrid as we can. But I sure as heck can't wait to get back into actual physical events like that. I mean, I miss the interaction with people. Uh, I miss the the discoverability that you have in a, walking a trade show floor that no virtual event can replicate. You know, unless you're talking about putting on a full uh, uh, 3D immersive virtual reality environment where I can walk around. It's like this is just it's not going to happen. Right? I need to go stumble down the aisle and go, what is that thing over there? I've never seen that before. How do you how do you find something if you don't know what you're looking for? And that's that's how. So I really look forward to those again. But uh, but the virtual aspect is fantastic, and it just it does open it up, and we can do so much more with it if we start bringing them together more. But I, I got a lot of opinions about all of that too, because I just love to rant about things. But but you're exactly right. I mean, um, you know, we were talking while we were prepping for the show. The pandemic sort of accelerated a lot of this technology, maybe you know, in the span of five months that might have been five years otherwise, right? Um, but VR wasn't really one of them, so we're not there in the VR trade show world yet. Maybe maybe that's still another five years out as those costs come down too. Um, but 
at the same time, I, I agree. I, I miss going and doing the discoverability and just stumbling around. But at the same time, I think there's a lot of show promoters of any kind, whether it's concerts or trade shows or whatever it is. So it doesn't really matter. Or even churches, for that matter, right? Anybody who's doing an in-person event of some kind, schools would count too. A lot of them, I think, at the beginning saw hybrid or virtualizing as, as the enemy because they wanted to have butts in seats, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's mm -hmm. great. But I think some people are starting to finally learn and discover that it actually doesn't mean losing out to online. It's actually an expansion of your audience because the people who want to go in person, they're still going to go. <laughs> like they're, they, they want to go back, right? I think it was Infocom a few months ago did a poll about you know, let's just say everything was back to normal tomorrow. How many people would go? It's like 95%, right? Like people want to go. Mm -hmm. But there are some people who never went because the travel, the costs, all those things just wasn't practical. But if they can buy a lower cost ticket and attend a lot of this stuff, keynotes and whatever, the education elements of it online virtually, they will absolutely do it. And it's going to be a fraction of a plane ticket and hotel and food for a week, right? So it's only going to grow the audiences, I think, once people figure out how to do it well. But like we've been saying, nobody's going to attend or pay attention to it if the video and the audio is bad because right. they'll check out. They're just not interested in, in the low quality delivery of it. I've I attended or spoken at quite a few virtual conferences over the last year, uh, probably more virtual ones in the last year than I had real ones in the years prior. So there's certainly a market for it. And, you know, this is my setup that you're seeing at right now that I would use for any of these speaking engagements, unless it's something that I move out into the main studio for, but mostly it's going to be here. And this is a, it's a good bar, right? This is a good quality setup here. Um, obviously it can be more, it can be bigger. But I think if you're going to try and draw in the audience that, oh, do, should I go in person or should I go virtually and they're only going to go virtually, then it really needs to go to a next level bar. We really do need to raise that bar even higher and get something that people can sit back at home and watch and go, oh, this is as good as being there it's, or at least almost as good of an experience as being there. I feel like I'm a part of this. I'm seeing something amazing. I'm getting a ton of information. Um, and the only thing I'm missing is that physical component of bumping into somebody there and, and uh, you know, everything that goes along with that. But yeah, it, the possibilities are absolutely there, but it, it takes time and it takes money and it does yeah. take money to do right. But again, like you're saying, people who would never have gone in the first place can now go buy a cheaper ticket. Well, that's a lot of sales that never would have happened in the first place. Right. And the potential to make a lot more money by the organizers is certainly there. Yeah. yeah. Doubling think, the audience, right? Yeah. That's and I think, I think a lot of pe a lot of companies will recognize the value of having this hybrid approach where it's almost like an upsell channel when you have the, you know, you can, ho you can offer the remote um, online experience for people who can't afford to go or, you know, we're, we're never sure if they really wanted to go um, and they can get the value of those keynotes and, and things like that. But um, if they find enough value there, I think what they'll find is too, okay, I want to get the next level of value next year and actually go in person. And, and that's where I can start to meet people and, 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 you know, get that additional value that I can't get online. In fact, the funny thing is, is Joseph and I actually met at NAB in person. Um, <laughs> that's how we know each other, um, before the pandemic started. And then, um, you know, and I think there's some value there. And again, the interesting thing is because of the pandemic, I think a lot of companies now have invested in a, in at least some of the technology necessary to do the online streaming. And so now when we kind of go back to something closer to normal and we do start to have the in-person conferences, um, they've already made that a lot of that investment. And so even perhaps some of that, you know, built some of that expertise that goes along with it as well. So it's, it's, it's good times ahead. Um, I have a question for you, Curtis, because I know you get involved in a lot of sort of corporate and, and enterprise uh, productions. Um, now that that knowledge base is there and, and sort of there's been that you know, forced ad adoption within a lot of the corporate space, you know, how do you see them continuing to uh, leverage these capabilities in, you know, as, as we move forward? I think we're going to see a lot of, um, from my perspective, higher quality all hands meetings <laughs> for distributed <laughs> organizations. So, um, for example, the company with which I am employed, um, we have, uh, Worldwide, we have one, two, three, four, five different offices across the globe. And so when it's time for an all hands meeting, 
Um, we, you know, we now have in place a lot of the things necessary to make them a lot higher quality than they were before. Before they were basically, you know, we'd have a bunch of people in one room and we'd have a team meetings for everyone else. Um, you know, and, and you can only imagine how that went. Wasn't, wasn't, it wasn't the highest that. quality. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there and done that. So um, I just think that you're going to see a much higher quality, a better experience overall. And, you know, what's interesting too is that the there I think there's a psychology between the higher quality experience as well, um, especially when it comes to things like sales and, um, you know, customer meetings and things like that. There is a, there's a kind of a natural communication of credibility when you have something that's a little bit nicer looking and nicer sounding versus just a, you know, Teams call or a, a Skype for business or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever else people are using today. So there's a, some value there. It's not just a nicer looking video, which just warms our hearts. It's actually, there's some psychological things there too that kind of increase credibility. Absolutely. I just anecdotally on that, you know, from from speaking from Epifan as a as a company standpoint, right? It, we've been doing that for years when it came to doing customer demos, right? They book a demo with a salesperson. That salesperson typically brings me or someone from my team, from the technical support team, into that call to actually do the product demo, right? And we make sure when we were in the office, we were do we had a dedicated studio space to do just those demos. Um, you know, now we've been doing that from home, which is a a little harder, but still totally possible. And it it totally changes the percentage of conversion to sale to do that, right? And and it's a huge deal. We've been noticing in the past year doing the webinars that we've been doing on, on obviously our products, but you know, we would sometimes attend smaller trade shows that it was hard to gauge how much value you were actually getting out of it based on the number of leads you were getting. And we found that some of those webinars will we can get twice as many leads from a one hour webinar that we were getting from some of those smaller shows in some cases. Um, and part of that is going you know, back to what we were saying earlier is that what we're producing from a webinar perspective is visually and, and audio wise high quality. So people are more engaged and they stay and they listen uh, as a result. And any company can do that. Any company with any product can do that. It's just a matter of deciding to take that effort. Um, and make sure it's as best as it can be. Well, I, I think we want to probably start wrapping up. This has been a great dis discussion. Um, I do want to get to a couple questions that we have coming in. Um, and I'm sure Aaron and Joseph, you, you know, might have a couple questions that came in on your channels as well. Uh, but uh, I have a question here um, from Shoji Productions. Question to all. At the end of the day, what's the easiest method to have one to two guests join a live stream and get a combination of decent quality and ease of setup slash use for the guests? Um, any thoughts? What is the easiest, lowest friction solution easiest, that you suggest? Easiest, hands down, StreamYard, honestly. It's, yeah. It is good enough for, for most things, especially if your guests have good quality video and audio on their end. It is by far the easiest, if that's your criteria. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's probably uh, StreamYard or something like it. There's a bunch of platforms that do kind of the same job. But yeah, yeah. again, I, I would just reel it back to saying, starting with, like we've talked about before, using a higher quality camera and higher quality audio, which does not have to be terribly expensive, you know, a, a mirrorless camera and a decent capture card and a USB mic in your set, right? Mm -hmm. Feed that into StreamYard where you can do that ease of production that you can't do in Zoom. That's the big difference, right? You can't clean it up and make it look production-wise good in Zoom and do the confetti and do the other things, right? Where you can in something like StreamYard. Any other thoughts? Well, if you want to step it up to the next level where, you know, do we go to SRT? It might make sense. Um, you know, you put a couple Pearl Nanos on a desk. Obviously great right and we've talked about that it's awesome but it's not the cheapest way to go to next level um mm -hmm. you know you, you can, well i guess there is srt software streaming isn't there i haven't played with that i think curtis you did something with that mm -hmm. didn't you yeah george and i use that yeah yeah george yeah. and i did and, and and i was impressed with what it you know when i went back and watched the show i was like wow and that was with me in that case i was using you know a, yeah a cab a camera microphone um Rivet is the name of the the service, um, so it's mm. all just a software based SRT encoder, and it was it was great. Yeah, 
Yeah, the Rivet app is one. I know there's uh, Larix makes um, mm-hmm. like an Android app, which you can use to encode SRT and, and works reasonably well. So does High Vision. They invented SRT. They also make their own app for, for phones. Um, but even OBS can output SRT. I mean, it's, I, it's, I think it's worth pointing out, though, that any of the SRT solutions, SRT is a one way protocol. So you, you then have to deal with how do you talk in a group with them. And that's yeah. one of the reasons that StreamYard, whatever, Restream, all those sort of cloud based ones make it just so much easier because you only need the one environment. So anything else beyond that, you're going to start getting into. Now you need to tell the guest to, to do two things. You know, send the good yeah, quality video have and have channel, some yeah. back channel of, yeah. it could just be audio only, it's fine, but you need something. And then that's, it's more things involved. So it's more steps to explain. You trade off, you trade off more complexity for higher quality, basically. Yeah. 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 Another a solution that I've used uh, quite a bit is I mentioned it earlier, Mimo Live, which I'm using for a lot of my graphics overlays, but it, it too has a peer to peer component where you can have someone call in and you set up a, a call receiver, if you will, in your system, and they are calling directly into your computer in there. And that works relatively well. I found that it's um, it's much better if you're wired. I mean, that goes with any, goes to say with any kind of <laughs> streaming stuff, but when you go wireless with them, you try to be Wi-Fi, that one falls apart pretty badly. But if you can insist that your callers are all on a wired connection, then that is a pretty good solution. And it gives you a lot of options, a lot of flexibility once you get their feed in and it's all handled in one place. So you can build a very, very advanced show with that, um, once you, assuming you can get a good clean signal coming in. I would say that that one's probably the, the sort of next step up from doing it all with the with the online ones is using, uh, the, what was the one, Mimo? Uh, Vmix Mimo, has yeah, it Mimo also, Live. also Ecamm. It's all, those are apps run on your own computer locally, right. but then they have this remote contributor web-based thing where the guest doesn't need any special software. They join through a web right. browser. So they make it as easy as StreamYard and Restream for the guest, but then a ton more powerful on the host side because you get all the tools that you've got available in those pieces of software. So I would say that one's probably the next, the next step up because it's also, you don't need to send your guests thousands of dollars of equipment to to join um but you still get pretty good quality uh tools on the host side i think it's a two-way communication so you don't have to set up a back channel it is it is and i think what uh, some people miss though is that you know they try to do that on their macbook air Mm -hmm. probably not (laughs) advised you you really probably need to be a wired b you need to be on a pretty powerful computer um because it's going to be that computer is going to be doing a lot of work and you also need to have a, a, a quite a bit of bandwidth as well because you're receiving a stream from the guest you're sending a stream back to them plus you're streaming out to whatever platform so you need to have a good you know low latency you know probably wired fiber connection probably or you know mm-hmm. a good quality internet connection so many of my chat is recommending for... obs ninja as well i guess that's, yeah. I, I know you guys yeah. i haven't played with that one yet yeah, again, I mean, when you when you go into that, I know Aaron's played with it a fair bit, but um, I follow the project and have very briefly touched on it. But it's it's a cool project, right? But like all things OBS, it's an open source project. It doesn't it has its potential pitfalls in that in that regard. And that's one of the areas when you start to deal with with a company is that it, you have someone to call, right? It's like DIY solutions are awesome. Um, they're very affordable. They're fun to build. But one of the downsides, of course, is who do you who do you call? You're right. You know, you're you're down to calling Ghostbusters. You're not calling a company. Right? It's, <laughs> you, you leave it's, comments on everybody's YouTube channels is what you do. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, I would say I would argue if you are a company of a of a certain size and I'm not going to create a barrier to that. But if you are a company at a professional level, it's worth paying professional money for a solution um, just to make sure that it's going to work and that you have someone to call. Um, you know, we, we've already had lots of customers that are really excited about making their own kits out of Pearl Nano and a camera and a microphone that they're going to throw into a Pelican case and ship around to people pre-configured. So the person just can kind of plug it in and push start and then they'll deal with the rest of it later. Um, so, you know, it, again, it just kind of depends on where you are. There's never a one size fits all, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone's going to have their own their own needs, their own workflows. Um, But I kind of wanted to propose one last thing is like, what if Aaron was mentioning earlier is big fan of, of hybrid solutions. Well, what if, what if hardware encoders were easier to feed into 
a cloud-based solution. Because right now, things like StreamYard, you can't use hardware to feed that. You have right. to use your computer in a browser. So what if a Perl Nano was feeding something virtual in the cloud that was doing that instead of, you know, the way we're doing it and the way you guys did it was feeding nanos into a physical Perl 2 and sending it back out. Well, like, it's like well, what well, would well, happen well, well, becomes George. an edge device, right? <laughs> George. <laughs> right. Are you proposing something here that we don't know about? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just okay. theorizing, the spitballing, throwing, <laughs> throwing it around. Uh, I like the idea. <laughs> I like the I, idea. I'm in. Where do I sign up? <laughs> well, I, but a serious question is that, you know, kind of to Dan's question, is that is that the kind of direction that we would go at a, at a, at a professional level? I mean, I think well, it sure, makes I mean, a lot of sense for many reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, go ahead, Joseph. No, I just, yeah, if you... If you don't have to have the heavy hardware on your side, I think that's like the Pearl 2 that I'm using, that I was using for our call, is a very expensive piece of hardware that everybody's calling into. And that's fine if you do this all the time, it makes sense for your budget. But if you're going to do these occasionally, then that's a lot of money to spend. And sure, you can rent the gear, but then you have to get the training on it and so on. But yeah, if there's a virtual system that's as easy as something like a StreamYard that everybody can call into from a variety of different hardware. They don't have to be using a Perl to call in. They can be calling in from a Perl or from OBS or from you know whatever system they have or just from a web browser. Then that's awesome. Give give the options and just aggregate all in one place in a virtual environment. That'd be cool. That's that's I think the value of SRT is that you you get that independence. You can get that from software. You can get that, you know, and, I, and that's the thing I appreciate about Epifan is you guys embraced SRT as opposed to creating your own protocol, your own proprietary thing. So, you know, hopefully, um, you know, we see more manufacturers take that on as well so that we could have those hardware encoders producing SRT streams, you know, and then have a cloud-based service that could, that could receive all that and aggregate. And, and that would, you know, that cloud-based service, then you could do a lot of really cool switching type things too in the cloud, which um, becomes really super powerful as well. I, like I think the with the... Uh... Oh, go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, I think the the other part of this is when you are doing entirely remote contribution, then a cloud-based solution makes a ton more sense than a physical local device. Because like with the with the stream we did with Joseph's Perl 2, we were using the Perl 2 basically as a way to receive these remote feeds and not really leveraging the rest of the features on the Perl 2, like the additional inputs and all the different hardware options it has on it. So we were really just using it for its own software. And that means it doesn't really need to be in a physical place anymore. So, you know, when you've got physical devices with a bunch of hardware inputs, HDMI, SDI, and all that capability, that's great if you're going to take advantage of it. And when you're doing just these remote caller, remote feed things, there's no reason for all those additional hardware ports. So, yeah, just move it into the cloud. <laughs> I, I'm also just excited about the idea of, like, sort of decentralizing the crew. I mean, a show like this, okay, we can, we can produce this with you know, just Cameron, one, one, maybe one person. But when you start getting into more levels of complexity, mm -hmm. you know, keying graphics, titles, media playback, um, the idea of being able to have those crew roles sitting in different, entirely different regions or not necessarily needing to be on mm -hmm. premise in a physical environment, it opens up a lot of opportunities to say, hey, maybe I'm the guy who produces graphics for live streams and I send my SRT with an alpha channel and, you know, I can queue graphics for 10 different clients without necessarily needing to always be in the room. Um, it opens up a lot of possibilities there as well uh, that I think could be quite exciting. Yeah. Speaking um, of, there was a question from my channel. People were asking about how is this show being switched and who, what does that look like on, on that end? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, our producer, Cameron, who's not in uh, the production feed, but he's in our back channel um, talking in our ears occasionally. Uh, he's doing all the, the switching on the Pearl that's aggregating uh, all five of our SRT streams together. Um, so he's he's playing producer there. Uh, you know, his home command center is not totally that different from yours, Aaron. There's a lot of screens and a lot of buttons and a lot of things going on. Um, but the, the fun part about that is that of everyone in this call, and and of to be honest, just about most people I know, Cameron has some of the worst internet at home, but it doesn't stop him from doing this because he's actually producing it remotely. He's not actually funneling any of the data through his home where he is, 
we're sending it to a Perl that's sitting in our office where we obviously have corporate level internet with lots of bandwidth. And he's just remotely controlling that Perl and he's, he's bringing up that behind the scenes shot again. Um, normally, pre-pandemic, he'd be sitting at that console playing with all the buttons and the switches, right? The way we, we always were used to, but he can actually do it remotely. Um, and in the, case of a, in the case of a Perl, he can actually do it through um, our system called Epifan Cloud, which can allow you to remotely control aspects of a, of a Perl. Um, Cameron's trying to bring up a screen share here, I think, to show his behind the scenes in his hey, house. Cameron, but... if you switch to my ISO, I've got a photo of your setup here. <laughs> yeah, he's he loves to change it on the fly just to make it risky. <laughs> we have a we have a we have a competition in Epifan that's like uh, share your home setup photos, <laughs> and Cameron won for for 2020. Uh, but I think he's going to have to make some upgrades because there's some other people competing. Um, but Cameron, why don't, if you yeah, yeah, we should. We should do that. Uh, I think Aaron's got probably got the jump on everyone right now. But uh, I'll just show Cameron's setup. This is his. Uh, this is his desk right now. He's got you know he's got his Pearl Mini on the left that he can do some switching. I think I'm not sure what he's using the Nano for right now. But you know a couple different monitors, clock. Actually, this up here is a little app. Um, we we're talking about back channel. This is called um, Unity Cloud, which is like a interruptible fold back that you can create a few different channels to do some back channel communication. So that's another solution people might want to check out is unity cloud. But, uh, you know, uh, this is, this is what a producer's desk looks like in 2021. And, um, it's, it's pretty cool. Looks a little different from the CNN newsroom. That's for sure. You know, <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not the same thing as old anymore. Um, which is interesting. I'll just show, if you want to see a janky setup, I'll show, uh, this is kind of funny. I saw this as well. I mean, we could show setups all day, but. Um, <laughs> That's um, a different show, judging people's setups. <laughs> uh, why don't I pull this up? This is, uh, we were talking earlier about like um, scraping from, you know, Skype or whatever. Here's a 12, I don't know what that is. Is that a 12 or a nine laptop setup for some Zoom? You know, this is pretty clunky. Um, if we can start to, push some of these sources into the cloud and do the mix there. You know, you might not need as many, as many laptops on your desk. <laughs> anyway, I just thought that was funny. Yeah. Um, and that's so, not uncommon. So we might want to uh, wrap up. We're reaching an hour now. Um, it's been a really interesting conversation. And I want to thank everyone for joining us. And of course, you know, the question coming up of where can I learn more about you know, how to create a live streaming setup or simple setups or more advanced setups. Um, you've got you've got a whole wealth of resources right here. So make sure to check out uh, Photo Joseph. I mean, all these guys have great YouTube channels. Photo Joseph, Aaron Parecki, and of course, Curtis Judd. And, uh, you know, uh, just a wealth of information on each of their channels. Um, so we really do appreciate having all of you here today. And thanks for joining us. And we should do this again sometime. This was a lot of fun. Let's do it. Yeah, Absolutely. thanks so much. It'd be great someday to have a panel in person. <laughs> <laughs> One day. Yeah, we're going to maybe One maybe day. we'll meet up at NAB later this year. Who knows? So. One day. <laughs> All right, thanks. And that's it for Live at Epifan. We'll see you again in two weeks on Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern, as always. And until then, so long for now. Take care. Bye, everyone.